Also, I just realized I'm rolling by. Good you. morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another episode of the Level Up Hour with the one and only, the illustrious Langdon White. Today, we're joined by the marvelous and all tra- well traveled Scott McCarty. Uh, we were discussing uh, where he lives versus where I live prior to the show. So, welcome, Scott. Welcome, Langdon, to the channel. Uh, Langdon, uh, do you want to? kind of go through our normal rigmarole or let Scott yeah himself first um let's uh let's do the normal rigmarole and then we'll do the introductions uh so I can give a little bit of context um and uh so I will share my awesome slides uh your slides are awesome Scott has been on the show before and so I'm sure he appreciates seeing these brilliant slides again um you know because i'm sure everyone does um so this is the level up hour where we talk about uh why containers rock and why you might want to uh start using them um and uh we're trying to convince you and then we uh also are we've actually been doing a lot of interviewing of people about kind of the ins and outs of containers and about how they get deployed and uh and the kind of the architecture for that um We also tend to talk about OpenShift as well. You know, we are on the OpenShift TV channel, um, you know, and how it relates to, uh, you know, kind of using containers natively on the operating system. Um, So that's the level up hour. Uh, Check out our website at uh, red.ht slash level up hour. And you can also find cool things like discounts on training and discounts on licensing. Um, You know, and if you want to get more into Podman, for example, you know, you can always go down, download Fedora. um, But you can also now get uh, Red Hat uh, or sorry, RHEL um, production subscriptions uh, through a developer uh, subscription. Uh, you know, I think it's up to 16 uh, that you can run yourself. Uh, so you can definitely play with everything that we're talking about here. If you have any trouble trying to play with those things, let us know and we will help you solve them. Um, and speaking of which, uh, you can find myself and Chris on Twitter. I'm Langdon with a one, and Chris Short is Chris Short. And uh, speaking of Mr. McCarty here, he is Father Linux on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so you can go check out his Twitter feed and all his millions of followers. Um, but if you want to chat with us, uh, kind of, you know, uh, with more kind of long form chatting, I guess, uh, we also have a Discord uh, that you can check us out on um, where there is sometimes uh, some active discussion around the various shows, including the level power but also like the gaming show that we do um so which is later today by the way oh is it today okay today Uh, at two eastern 1800 utc so cool cool uh so uh yeah so check that out we usually do a recap of everything that's coming up uh for the day uh at the end of the show so we'll probably cover it again so more details later um, so today we're going to talk about UBI. Um, we have talked about UBI on the show before, and uh, as we were joking around earlier, this is not um, a universal basic income, uh, but instead a, a, a base container image that uses a Red Hat uh, provided software, um, but in the idea being that you can kind of have a redistributable container for all the things you might want to build, uh, you know, rather than the things that Red Hat wants to build and ship. Um, also have show notes from last time. Oh, uh, so before I move on, let me just kind of say like, uh, you know, so we're going to talk uh, more in depth about what the UBI is like internally, rather than uh, how to use it, which is more what we normally cover on the show. Um, sorry, Chris, did you have a question? No, I just said I was dropping the links for. Oh, you. cool! Thanks. I actually have them nicely copied over somewhere so that I could I could do that too. Um, to it. <laughs> but so I I got the show notes done for uh, the episode before last and last episode. Um, those were interesting topics, uh, particularly the uh, Podman V three kind of deep dive. We had uh, one of the architects of the of the uh, Podman project on the show, Brent Bowdy, um, and he's always a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I think that was, I think it was really successful. I think it was really popular and I think we had a lot of good questions. So we may even uh, twist his arm and bring him back um, to talk Mm -hmm. about the show or talk about Podman uh, some more. Um, And then last time we were supposed to talk more about Docker Compose, but ended up talking a lot about uh, the differences between deploying something for OpenShift versus deploying something uh, in Podman. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we're going to do more with Docker Compose and Podman in a future episode in a couple of weeks. Um, I have a lot of intro today. Uh, So next week. Sorry. So next week. Coming up um, next week. Yes. We are going to have Chris Wright, CTO of uh, Red Hat on the show, and we're going to be talking about... uh, some of the 
kind of like future ideas around Kubernetes and like how to maybe kind of wrap uh, how you think about Kubernetes around a little bit. It's not just a, it's not just a way to deploy software necessarily. And, and mm-hmm. we want to get into that a little bit. Um, be primarily driven from a show he did, like a quick hit um, show called Technically Speaking about with he and Kelsey Hightower that they did. Um, they recorded a couple of weeks ago, but it will be also dropping during the show. So we're going to feature that and talk with him about that. Hopefully, we'll also talk about what's coming up at Red Hat Summit, which is the following week, and KubeCon EU, which is the week after that, uh, and what he's really interested in going to see, um, and what, as hopefully, by extension, you might be interested in as well. Um, please remember, we are we are running a contest. We've decided uh, we're going to try to extend it a little bit. If you want to go to KubeCon EU, please share somewhere on the social media about uh, what you have learned on the show um, and then come and bring us a link to it on our Discord uh, so that we can enter it, you into a raffle for free tickets to both Red Hat Summit and KubeCon EU. Except the Red Hat Summit ones, everyone is free, so <laughs> everybody on the show gets a ticket. I was about to say, wait, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to take complete credit for you get a free ticket to red hat summit um so does everyone else um but uh you know the cube kind of you does have a a you know a decent sized fee um and so we would like to give out some free tickets to that whoo that was a lot all right. all right so so scott mccarty uh let me stop sharing um uh would you care to introduce yourself as to uh you know what you do at red hat Sure. So uh, I finally had a chance to watch your episode with Brent Bode, who's on our team. And uh, so I work with Brent a lot. Um, I'm, I am a product manager um, for Podman, Builda, Scopio, Cryo, and Red Hat Universal Base Image. So basically all of these pieces, parts that are in OpenShift and RHEL. Um, all the fun stuff. All the fun stuff. But the funny part about UBI is it touches literally everything yeah. in the world. And so I get every question on the planet from like security stuff to like, when is OpenSSL getting updated? I'm like, I don't know. Oh, That's Lord. a different team. <laughs> um, like, like to, I literally had one about Python this morning. They're like, you do UBI? What's going on with Python? I'm like, don't know. Like, I don't run all of RHEL. Like, <laughs> right. You don't? Like, this is insane. You're not the whole RHEL yeah. team, Scott? I think yeah. Well, not, or, not only right. is it all the like bits that go into UBI, right? But it's also like, it is a significantly different distribution model. Uh, yep. for like any of our software uh, yep. so you know we we're first trying to get ubi out the door like that that was a train wreck through our like it's really hard to give free software away at red hat <laughs> yes yes it is <laughs> weirdly enough um yeah and then and just just even building it right is uh, a non-trivial exercise i became um, an amateur lawyer i became an amateur like i mean basically everything export compliance uh, you know, open wow. source compliance. Like wow. I dealt with like every, I mean, everything with launching UBI. Yeah, yeah. I launched UBI too. So at least the good news is I know it all really well, but like it is, it gets literally any question at Red Hat could somehow come to UBI. Like if right. you're using wow. a container basically. So like, yeah. they're always like, well, how do I do this? What do I do with this? What's the legal? Can I redistribute this? What happens if I add this package? Right. Right. Um, so when can I get Podman inside UBI? <laughs> Actually, that's that we have tech preview bits of that today that are on. Oh, wow. The oh, really? If you look. Yep. yep. And oh. it remained tech preview for two dot releases and we'll end up GAing it. Dan Walsh ended up getting I finally roped him into getting interested in it, paying attention to it more. And uh, we have all kinds. Of, so it was, it was hard for me to educate people why that why why we want that. Like everyone's like, why do we want that? Why don't they just use Podman? I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, let me give you some crazy ideas. So like <laughs> I'm a sysadmin. And I need to run this version of Podman, and it, I'm not allowed to install it on the system because yep. we certify on Rel 8.2. Okay, well now I can use a Podman container and get the version from 8.4, which is 3.0, running on my 8.2 system. I don't break any of the compliance stuff at my company, and I still get to use the new version of Podman. Ha ha! Right. Containers are awesome. Um, it's funny because and- we talk about application containers on the show a lot. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I don't think they get anywhere near the you know, kind of marketing push or whatever that they should. I mean, it's like, it's so much easier to run whatever, 
you know, gnarly thing that you want to, yeah. um, you know, using a container. Um, we actually opened like this. We started the series of the show really about like, how do you build an application container that kind of contains all the tools that you want to use um, and then ship it around your data center and have it kind of wherever you want yeah. it so that you don't have to muck with the systems that and are let's, running real let's, stuff. Let's give you the even crazier one. So we had a problem where a partner of ours was running RHEL 7 and they were locked into RHEL 7 for a hardware solution that they're delivering. Mm-hmm. And they're like, but we need Podman 3.0 or whatever, you know, Podman yeah, 2.2. Yeah. It has some bug, blah, blah, blah. 1.64 that we released. That's the last, like, you know, RHEL 7 is in the sunset now. I mean, like it's, the sun is setting. The sun is still over the horizon and we do CVEs and that's about it, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it's very stable. But like Podman, people always want the latest, greatest version. So they're like, hey, we need 2.2.3. And I'm like, nah, it ain't going to happen. Like we cannot update that ever again. The real program will kill me. Like they don't, they do not <laughs> let me do this. Um, and so I was like, but we do support RHEL 8 containers on RHEL 7. Like we do support that at tier two. So let's bring a Podman container back and run Podman in a container using the version of Podman that's there, but you still get the newer features that you need for this thing. That's a pretty killer, like that truly unblocked a serious cluster fire problem I had, like where I'm like, I don't know how to support this. That is like such a mind blowing concept, right? Like that is awesome, right? It's awesome, right? Like it (laughs) unlocks people so they can do what they need to do, which is like the agile way of thinking, right? Like how Mm -hmm. can I unblock these people to do what they need to do? Yeah. Right. Right. So So I I dropped the link in chat to the, tech preview uh pod man oh cool so cool. feel free to kick the tires on it field questions in discord we can get them back to scott and company so they can get it uh you know one thing i will i will plug the alternate route there with kind of rel 8 beyond right is that um the uh, that's uh, this is actually the goal of something like AppStreams, right is also yep. part of trying to solve that same problem and uh we when we were developing that project you know we we often refer to the too fast, too slow problem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we have customer A, right, who says, I need the latest version of Podman. Oh, but don't change anything else, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but then at the same time, you have someone else who's like, oh, my entire infrastructure is working on Podman, you know, ancient, right, or whatever. Um, but I need new hardware. So, um, you know, please, you know, use the older version of Podman on the latest version of things. Yeah. So I think when you're for coming from the perspective of a kind of a single customer or a single user, you always have a complaint, you know, and depending on the current perspective of wherever you're at or whatever you're doing, it's that all of RHEL or Linux or whatever is moving too fast or vice versa, it's all moving too slowly. Um, and I think when you look at it in aggregate, you start to realize, you know, that everybody has a problem with the speed of something. Um, yeah. And so that's actually the genesis of the AppStream stuff. Um kind of it was concurrent with the work around containers and i think now we have two really nice ways of approaching that problem that can work independently as well as together to try to give you that too fast too slow solution across you know the you know our you know uh, basically our platform right uh, which i think is super interesting but so, moving well, on well, uh, I was just talk about- one last thing oh, yeah. back to ubi um Builda and Scopia will drop in UBI in Rel 84. And then the nice. plan is to add Podman in Rel 85. So there's a Podman image today that's tech preview, but you have to have a Rel subscription and you have to authenticate to grab it. But like in and but in when Rel 84 drops here in a few weeks, you'll you'll see Builda and Scopia. And those are those are fully supported on Rel, but they're also GA. So now we're adding them to UBI. So it'll be freely redistributable. And then we're doing the same thing with Podman in 8.5 is kind of the plan right now. Um, so just for clarification, you need to register and, and download it, but, um, you should be able to do that with a developer subscription, which is no cost. So, so it is accessible for, you know, without paying money. Um, it's just that it's not accessible without uh, kind of agreeing to the T's and C's at the moment. Um, that brings up a really good point. We actually had the question with Brent, um, you know, but we were joking around about how we never actually know when anything's going to release. So it's nice to have product managers on occasionally uh, who, who are like, oh yeah, here's exactly when this is going to happen. Um, so it's good to hear. Uh, so 8.4 is the target for uh, for basically the new versions of Podman, which is awesome. Um, and then you were saying 8.5 is when the container well, version Pod- of Podman? 
technically today, even in Rel 8 3 is when we released a Podman container. To be honest with you, I wasn't happy with the UX of it. I think the UX okay. is a little funky. You still have to run it as a privileged container, which is fine. Yeah, but you have to run it as dash dash privilege. We are working on like Dan, especially this week. I know he's been working on all kinds of different ways you can run it. And we're looking at like what modifications we can make in the container image to make it easier to use, et cetera, et cetera. Like we're looking at improving the UX over the next dot release so that like when we release it in rel, you know, we're going to GA Podman in a container on rel in 8.5 is the plan. And then when we GA it, so I have this rule. I don't release anything into UBI unless it's GA. So like that's why Build and Scopy are dropping in 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 ubi and 84 because they've those container images are already ga um and then when podman ga is in a container as in the ux is good i feel like it passes all the sniff tests like qe is good our docs are good then we ga it and then it'll drop in ubi so it'll be like you said redistributable without a subscription and just <clears throat> you can test it today to, for anybody who's new to the show build a so podman as we jokingly refer to, is often uh, referred to as a wrapper. Um, yes. You know, and so it's uh, Podman the wrapper, uh, which we still don't have T-shirts for. Which no, I have a T-shirt cool. for it. You don't. I don't have a T-shirt for it. That's true. <laughs> um, but uh, so Build uh, is kind of the build component of Podman. Uh, Scopio is kind of the search and um, and kind of delivery side of Podman. It's um, the pairing knife. Yeah, I call it the chef's yeah. knife pairing knife. There you and- go. Hibachi knife. Yeah. Right. Okay. You so, know. and then, so Podman, Podman is, is kind of the knife. experience yeah. for the, for the overall set of things that you need to do with containers. Um, but if you want to do like build a CI engine, for example, you might want to just include build a, for example, um, because you don't, you don't need all of Podman. You just want the build infrastructure. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, it, you know, it's kind of built in the Unix philosophy of, you know, each tool does a job, but then sometimes you want to wrap those together to give you a full experience. Um, so we had a question come up in the chat um we have a couple that, questions we had a couple of questions uh mm-hmm. do you i was gonna go off and talk about uh ubi versus ubi minimal versus the rel image but is there another question we should answer before that's quicker than that uh i mean there's so there is some confusion right like i want to acknowledge that plain risky's question i think is worth addressing early right. so we can eliminate confusion so okay so okay. that's what i was going to kind of go yeah. to scott was is like okay so If I go and look for a base image from Red Hat, um, let's ignore for the sake of argument the kind of the strongly built images. So like the ones that already have Apache and PHP and all that jazz, right? Mm. Um, Instead, let's just talk about kind of the the more basic ones. So we have, uh, to the best of my knowledge right now, we have UBI minimal. There's a UBI micro, I think, in the works. um, And then there's like a UBI. And then there's also like a rel image what's the difference or like is are they all things that we expect to continue like forever or is there a recommendation around which one we choose under some conditions or should we always be choosing ubi or ubi minimal and getting away from rel images yes yeah, so so in rel how to word this so in rel 7 let's start with the history so in rel 7 we had that the end user license agreement was only the the rel end user license agreement which which back in the day the way you would install software was we delivered industrial grade flour industrial grade sugar you know industrial grade you know water like in big bins bags and boxes and barrels to our customers and then they mixed it all together and they made cakes at scale right like that that's what we sold enterprise software and so it was really fine when the when the you know the sysadmin architects and developers all mixed the cake on premise in a data center or a shared, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's how our original entitlement model was based around all of that. Like we would sell the company a subscription and then they could use whatever they wanted in that industrial data center, you know, or whatever they had, they bought whatever subscriptions they could use it, but they were not allowed to redistribute it because it's free software. It's open source and they're allowed to, but contractually they would agree not to is how I should say it. And that was just so that we could get them to, we could come up with a monetization model where we could actually make money and actually, you know, sell them something so that we could make money and keep building free software. Um, and, but technically what people don't realize is like, if you don't have a rel agreement, if you don't sign the red hat, uh, enterprise license agreement, you can redistribute rel all you want. Like there's nothing like you're not breaking any laws, right? Like it's a contractual agreement that businesses make with each other. And it basically says, we'll give you support as long as you pay us for the copies that you install. And, and it was just the only way we could come up with in the United States and the world with a legal framework that would actually make this work, right? Like you have to have some 
these locks keep honest people honest. And that's all this is. This is like a legal agreement to keep honest people honest. Um, now that said, that breaks down when you get into containers. And when we released Docker in RHEL 7, we still had the container images protected by the exact same end user license agreement as the bits for the servers. And so we had customers that couldn't, they would, they would create a container image with RHEL 7 and then they would go to redistribute it to their friends and be like, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. You know, like I contractually, I'm not supposed to do that. And it took us a while to figure out how to do this in a way that was, that made sense. And so when we launched RHEL 8, we came up with this concept of UBI, which is really just a UA, to be honest with you. It's a legal, it's a different end user license agreement. Um, it is not actually different bits, although people perceive it as that because it's mm. just how human brains work. But it's actually nothing more than a different end user license agreement that allows people to redistribute the set of content that is in UBI, which is a subset of RHEL. Um, and it's not all the things that Red Hat, it's not layered products, it's not OpenShift, it's not, I mean, it is OpenShift because OpenShift comes with RHEL, but it, it, it comes from RHEL. It's always a subset of RHEL. Now, that said, there are three UBI base images. I manage the base images. Other people uh, manage the layered ones like Python and Ruby. Actually, Brian Galhar manages Ruby and Python and all the layered ones that are like oh, wow. programming. Lines. But actually, other people manage other ones like mm -hmm. because there's a bunch of different subsystem teams in RHEL. So like I will specifically talk about the base images, even though I know how all the others, they all fall under that same UBI EULA. So they're all UBI in people's minds, but they're really just RHEL released under a different end user license agreement. Now that said, there are three base images today. There is minimal, standard, and the one that has system D in it. We call it the init and init, call it the Cadillac yeah. image. Like that's the one that you just do a yum install, system CTL, enable Apache in you know, our HTTPD and things just work like magic habits. You treat the init image like a VM. If you're like kind of bringing stuff along from the old world. Um, the standard one we had targeted for 80% of use cases. So it works just like a regular rel system where you do a yum install a pat you know httpd things work um if you're in a docker file or whatever container file um the the minimal has something called uh, micro dnf which is which pulls in less dependencies and can in some cases uh make an image smaller you know like it'll trim out a few megabytes i think it's like 100 i forget what the latest version in rel 8 is but call it 110 ish megabytes and then the standard is about, you know, or maybe it's about 130 megabytes. The, the standard is about 205-ish. And then the init is about like 208-ish. You know, it adds another couple of megabytes for the few things we had for systemd. Those are the three ones to... Now, being honest, 80% of the users end up just seeing UBI minimal and just going for that. And then what happens is a lot of times they'll add packages. Sometimes it even ends up adding regular yum because yum or, you know, yum slash DNF gets pulled in as a dependency. And so it ends up having micro DNF and DNF and, you know, and next thing you know, the image is actually <laughs> like it defeats the bigger yeah, right. than, yeah. no, it ends up being bigger than the regular standard image. And right. It's right. counterintuitive, but it's what happens. It still doesn't matter. I look at our download numbers, 80% of the people are using UBI minimal, um, right. or at least 80% of the automated builds that are probably driving this are. Um, now in row eight, four, we're adding one more. We're adding UBI micro. UBI micro is special. It is actually truly different than the other ones. It has no yum and DNF installed. It has no RPM command. It has nothing. You can fire it up and you'll be like, oh, this is cool. I can run bash. What the do I do with this now? Like, I don't <laughs> understand what this is for. Um, the reason why, because most people will try to use it in a Docker file and it will fail. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. cannot build it with a Docker file. Not yet. I'm working on some really cool tricky stuff with Podman to make this super elegant. But that'll probably be more like RHEL 8.5 as yeah. a sneak preview. But um, but um, RHEL 8.4, when it comes out, you'll have to use Builda. You will use the yum, at, you know, slash DNF in RHEL 8.4 on the host to then like do the dash O, you know, install into a directory. And you'll like basically install into a mounted UBI. And then you will create another layer and then you will commit that layer. But the beauty of this is this has three beautiful things like. You're using trusted rel content. So the quality of the content is really good. You are not adding new packages into your environment that are not already part of rel. So you're not expanding your attack, you know, footprint, you know, attack surface. Um, because if you already have these packages on a rel host somewhere, somebody can th theoretically attack these. You're just adding the exact same packages that are on a rel host into the container image. So you're basically keeping the environment minimal than the total permutation set of packages that you have in your environment. And then third, 
the actual individual container image is pretty damn tiny. Um, we can get it down like a base image right now is like 12.9 megabytes compressed Whoa. and about 38 megabytes uncompressed. And then wow. we can build, we've done some tests with open SSL. We can get like 80 megabyte open SSL image. Uh, we can get like 120 megabyte Apache image, about 120 megabyte engine X image. And right now you'll have to build those today, but I am working on a roadmap where we'll sort of have a UBI micro family of container images where we'll have like a pre-built open SSL one, a pre-built Apache one, a pre-built engine X one. You just grab these tiny images. Now, again, you're going to have to use them with Builda if, or, or once it already has the app in it, you know, like say you just want to use Apache, you may be able to use a copy, you know, just copy some, you know, like a web root in and do some of that. You may be able to consume some of those without having to muck with them. But the UBI micro that's coming out in Rel8, you'll have to use Builda to add anything to it. But I mean, like if you're, I mean, if you're doing an Apache or whatever, wouldn't you bind mount the content anyway? I mean, a lot of the time. Yeah. 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 Most so, of I the mean, time. Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess. I don't know. So uh, what came up with the chat was like, you know, uh, it kind of going through a multi stage build process. Um, it'd be really, you know, at least, you know, my immediate thought, right, is it'd be nice if I could use a Docker file or a container file um, and do a multi stage oh. build where. Oh, yes. I wish closing. it was possible. I spent yeah. three hours this week trying to find some hacky way to figure out how to do that, but it is not possible. Okay. What yeah. I am planning on doing is not even using a multi stage build. One of the features that got overlooked, and this is pure incidental, I'm, I'm like 99% sure this is incidental. I still, I talked to Valentin about it last week a little bit and talked, I haven't had a chance to bring it up with Dan and Brent, but uh, but in a nutshell, the dash dash mount option is missing with Podman build. Mm -hmm. We have the dash V bind mount option, but we don't have the mm -hmm. dash dash mount option. The dash dash oh. mount option does some really friggin' cool stuff. You can bind, you can mount, uh, container images. People don't realize this. You can actually like specify a container image and then give it a mount point inside of the container that you're firing up, and yep. it will just show up as a directory. But you're like right. mounting this another is how you image do, like advanced linking. This is, yeah, this is like yeah. Uh, now like imagine a scenario where yeah. I have a Docker file that bind mounts regular UBI. I run the yum tools, you know, yum and RPM from the regular UBI image right. to add packages into the UBI micro, then do a yum clean all and then save that extra layer. And I can do it with like two commands in a Docker file. Like uh, it's not you know, even going to be multi-stage. It'll just uh, be like a regular Docker file. I'm pretty wow. sure Dan Walsh did an article or a blog post or something about doing essentially exactly that. It might've been, might been Colin. I don't know. There was somebody who did this with Docker a long time ago. Um, using that exact same technique. I think when it you might could have been do with bind mounts, you could yeah. do well. So you could do when he was looking for micro, when he hadn't built micro DNF yet. Um, he yeah, was I think he was doing at something this. like this. I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, we looked at doing works. like a, I looked last week at everything. I looked, you can do a Podman mount on the UBI micro image if you want, or build a mount. Then you could like mount that into a container, you know, and then basically install mm -hmm. into that directory. You can do some hacky things to kind of make this. But I want it to be super elegant. I want it to be like a single command, single build command, very simple Docker file, like, you know, container file. I want it to be like two, three lines in the Docker file and a single build command. And we, once we add the dash dash mount option to the build, you know, podman build dash dash mount equal, and then you'll be able to specify containers. Then within the Docker file, we'll, we'll probably be able to do something, you know, tricky with the paths and the library paths to make sure that you can just run the yum command and it looks like it's natively installed, even though right. it's not, it's actually coming from the, the other image but that's the plan to kind so, of make that more elegant one thing i wanted to kind of quickly mention just because uh we haven't covered this on the show and i and i don't think it's commonly understood is that um builda actually when you do builds with builda um it actually follows a lot more the rocket model which very few people have any experience with um <laughs> which is that essentially you can kind of build up a container image um using builda commands and that like feeding it a docker file is actually almost like a secondary activity like so yeah. basically what it's doing is actually just kind of feeding that set of uh, commands if you're doing docker and you don't know what you want to build right what you typically do is you you know take some sort of base image you log into it then you install all the stuff you want and set up all the stuff you want and then you do essentially so you go outside and do a Docker commit, right? Podman has that support as well. But if you're doing it with Builda, it's actually slightly different in that you can actually give it the set of commands that you want to build and you will get container images along the way. Uh, so it has a, a somewhat more flexibility about building up a container um, than a container file would do. 
The downside is that it doesn't have the the ease of use that a container file uh, distributed, right? Um, but you can get to very, very nice, clean, quick images, you know, essentially with a bash script instead of feeding it a container file. You know, a container file in a lot of ways is basically a bash script, but if you use an actual bash script with Builda, you can actually get to some cleaner uh, containers. Um, yeah, Rocket is deprecated now. It is, I think it is officially retired. Actually, I was just going to yeah, CNCF. It, it, it's, it was the um, first CNCF thing to be sunset, whatever. I forget the term that they use. Yeah. Right? Like it's yeah. after graduated where it has passed, you know. Right. Like, it's not deprecated. I don't think they called it that, but it, it's definitely in the sense of being worked on. No right. longer being worked on. And it, so it's it, to be clear, but it's not it does Rocket bring some great ideas. Just, right. Yeah, it just follows that the style of how Rocket worked. And it was interesting in the early I days, right? Rocket it. was very much uh, the tool of choice for sysadmins, and developers tended to focus on Docker. Um, and, uh, you know, and so eventually they kind of came together, at least in my opinion, right? And now we have kind of Builda, which gives you that really tight 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 containers if you want them mm -hmm. um you know so you know appealing to the kind of sysadmin side of the world um whereas developers or casual users in a sense can can still use something like container file and feed that to podman and everything just works you can actually feed it to build it directly but uh podman makes a nicer wrapper around it yeah and i just i just literally while you guys are talking just checked to see if the build a bud command had the dash dash mount option but it doesn't so i can't yeah. I was thinking I may have found a hacky new way to make this work. <laughs> to, to break but. it in a different, <laughs> a new and different yeah. way. Yeah, nice. Um, but, but no, no, you asked though about rel images. So like for each of these, so rel seven, they were all rel images. They had the rel end user mm -hmm. license agreement. There was no UBI EULA. Then right. we added the UBI. When we launched rel eight, we actually added a set of container images for rel seven. There were identical bits that had the UBI EULA. And then we did the same thing in rel eight for compatibility. We left the rel eight base images in place, just like rel seven. We don't necessarily recommend that anyone ever uses them, but we wanted them to be there just in case other layered products and some companies were building, you know, like who knows what weird stuff in rel nine, to be honest with you, we'll probably get rid of, you know, there probably won't be a rel nine image. There'll only be UBI nine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really a matter of whether the EULA, whether we need the other EULA or not. Like, do we need the regular rel EULA for some of the container images? And um, some of them we did. So we ended up having both. Actually, I just remembered we made a decision that we will end up still having the rel 9 mounts. The the rel 9 namespace will exist in, in, uh, in rel 9. And that means that there will be some container images that have the rel EULA, you know, with. But, but they won't likely be the base images at all. Right, so it and just I think uses people. Right, I think, and I think right. the, the audience question, uh, I, which I think was JP Dave, but it could have been somebody else, um, was you know essentially that is that you know UBI eight right and and Rail eight seem really comparable aside from the ULA. They're identical. Example. They're okay, literally they're... identical. The only difference is a piece of metadata in one of the labels that points to the ULA. Okay, that is the only difference. Literally, and the literally. repositories they point to by default. Yeah, and the repo. Uh, no, that well, they, that's not even how. Well, yes, because you're right. You're right because UBI does have an extra text file in the yum.d directory where it points to UBI, and then the rel eight one doesn't have that. That's correct. And then right. um, okay, and then but they both in the the rel channels actually come from the host, not from the image. So actually, there's nothing in the rel eight image that's different. If you dropped the UBI text file in there, it would function identically the same and then that one you is different but yeah you're gotcha. right gotcha you're right. okay um so generally speaking the the expectation is kind of go towards the ubi images is probably the the right answer yeah 95 um, percent of people and we we've, we've even we've done it on the show too is like um you know where i'll you know i'll go get a ubi image and then use stuff that is protected by the rel eula by yeah doing it from a subscribed rel machine um and then it works um it'd be nice if there was a way and it, it, like one of the things that i think we're discovering around the container stuff right and i think red hat has been uh kind of on the forefront of trying to help with this is like all that helpful metadata that you have around your binaries you know that you get like in rpm is yeah. kind of still 
difficult to uh, find in a sense um, in container world. Um, so Without like it's really RPMs, hard to indicate yeah. it, that, mm-hmm. you know, this, hey, this UBI, you know, this uh, image that I built or whatever, this container file isn't going to work <laughs> unless you do it on a subscribed machine. There's no way for me to tell a user that without essentially a comment in the Docker or in the container file, uh, which, yeah. you know, it's unfortunate, but it's kind of the way the infrastructure is, and we don't want to rock the the you know muscle memory boat, right? On changing how people do things. Yeah, I've been working on expanding UBI ever since we ever since we created it, but so far, Realm Nine, we don't we don't really know what completely. I'm not 100 percent sure where we'll be with Realm Nine yet. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd like to have all of Rel and UBI, but we don't yet. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, that's I mean, all I is... can really say on that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say I can. You can ask me more. I don't know if I can. No. Answer so, all right. So, so here's another question that uh, did not come up today, but came up in the past, um, uh, which I'm sure you get, uh, like, what I don't know, hourly basis. Um, probably. Why are UBI images so big? Um, and uh, and then I will probably give my typical rant of why do you care? But um, the. Uh, but I will leave. I will hear the your short answer, answer is we. So Adam Samlick and I did a talk at DevConf a couple, like a month and a half ago or whatever. Um, and Adam has been working on this for like, I don't know, two years, year and a half. So upstream, long story short, is container images are large because the dependency tree in RHEL has never been optimized to make it for smaller. Containers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For containers and yeah. just to make it small in general. So Fedora for the last year, year and a half, two years, I don't remember the exact time frame, has had a strategic initiative, like one of their top level initiatives to like minimize. It, it may have been. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. Um, one of their strategic initiatives to basically minimize RHEL, you know, minimize Fedora, I'm sorry, because it not just for containers, but for everything, for like a core OS style use case, for edge use case, for all kinds of things. But it is really, really hard to go to every. Think about how many packages are in Fedora. There's like, I don't remember, 20,000 packages or whatever. So you've got to go to every package maintainer, every subsystem team, and you've basically got to educate them on why they have to go do a bunch of work that they don't want to do. Like, mm-hmm. you're like, it's just mm-hmm. like everything else in the world. You're like, wait a minute, why do I got to change this? This isn't broken. Like, like, and you're like, oh, you should make this a soft dependency. You should do this. And you should do that. And you should do And you sound like that guy. Like, you're like, you come up, you're like, you know what you need to do. You know, that's like when some guy, you're at the gas station, he comes up, he's like, you know what you need to do? Put a steel bumper on the front. You're like, I don't want to do it. I don't know why you're talking to me. Stop talking to me. Like, <laughs> like that's how all these subsystem teams feel, right? Like, so, so basically Adam built this really cool tool and he's been working on this project for a long time to like basically show people all the dependencies that get dragged in and why and kind of get them to like open their eyes and go, oh, maybe I'm pulling in some dependencies that I really shouldn't be. And then specifically, we're working with like the GLibc team to do all kinds of cool things, like pull out all the TZ data except for UTC. So all containers will run in UTC. Um, pull out some of these GConf character converter set things that honestly, I don't even know what they do. Like, I remember I'm not when that it was, deep it was a big deal that, to pull yeah. out the translations. Um, you know, it's like you got by default, you know, 150 languages or something yep. with the GLibc install. Um, and to do that right, you have to have separate packages in Fedora and RHEL. And that's mm-hmm. why the GLibc team, this is a lot of work for them, right? Like they yeah. got to basically break their package up into a whole bunch of other sub packages. And then that adds more metadata to RPM and, and YUM, which then actually over time with enough patches actually slows down container builds. So like one of the other features in UBI is it only has the metadata for the latest container and it doesn't, it doesn't leave, it doesn't, it only has the latest of everything. So like it's super fast to build compared to a rel image because rel has to look for every version of every package, pull all that metadata down. UBI just has the latest of everything. That's one other little side benefit of UBI. But, um, but yeah, this is a lot of work. This is like years in the making to minimize a dependency tree that's been built up over 20 years. You know, so it's well, and it's, what I want to make the point here um, is and the reason for this, right, or the reason why there's a bunch of competitor images that don't have this problem is because they're hand building those container images uh, without any of this package dependency management stuff. So, yes, yeah, some of that. I agree on that. Another thing is, is it's a misperception. Like if you look, I, I, I have this article that is wildly popular called comparison of container images. If you compare Alpine, Ubuntu, Fedora, RHEL, CentOS, blah, 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 name another distribution, you know, Debian, and you add Java, like headless, blah, 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 <laughs> JVM, 
they're all about the same size. They're all yeah. about 350 megabytes. Like, <laughs> Once like you put Java if, in play, it's yeah. if, well, and that one's not even that big to be honest with you, but like you add Apache, they're all about the same size. I mean, you add as soon as nobody so despite runs the OS, fact that it's small, it's smaller at the beginning, by the time yeah. you actually have a usable container, yeah. they're the same size. They're the same size almost. And then, and then I talk to customers and partners all the time that are embarrassed, but they're like, yeah, we have this like 1.5 gigabyte image after we add all our stuff to it. And like Ouch. they kind of say it quietly like that. They go, you know, I mean, it's like 1.5 gigabytes, you know, and you're like, I mean, dude, I'm not I'm not judging, you know, like like, I mean, it is what it is. Like it, there was this saying back in the day when I started Red Hat 10 years ago, I was a solution architect, you know, nobody runs an OS for the point of running an OS. Like nobody says, ah, sweet, we got this ten thousand dollar server. Let's fire up an OS and just keep it pristine and not do anything on it. Like, no, the whole point is the application. So like, right. A container image is small until you add an application, and then as soon as you add the you know, the actual thing that you need to do, it's gonna get big. Like it's gonna get way bigger. Mm. Um, some people, some hipsters, some cool kids, they are running like GoLang binaries and C binaries, and those yeah, people like, have like five megabyte images. Good build for them. From scratch, great. Yeah, yeah build awesome. from scratch. And well, you they, gotta I mean, compile every time. Great. Basically, That's what awesome. it means is like if if you want to have a truly small image, right? It means right. that you cannot leverage the support of the ecosystem. Exactly. Um, and and that's it has its trade off. That's a trade off. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. You, you yeah. make a choice under some condi- like you like, if you want to go build that Java image and go build it by hand and put only the stuff in there that you want. That's fine. You know, let me know in a year when you're done with that. Um, you know, instead of, you know, me being able to write, you know, a single line in a container file and be done. Um, yep, like that, that's the trade off. And sometimes it's worth it. Um, but I think the, you know, as the, the joke is already starting in the audience and I was thinking this too, you know, but the, the, uh, the shaming of the container sides, you know, is like, yeah. recognize what you're doing here. This is a trade press, um, story, not a, a way of comparison, right? I mean, like, uh, I actually just saw an article about how the new X one from Lenovo is too thin. Like it doesn't <laughs> like it's it's like they're like, yeah, I'm like trading off the ability to like use my computer mm-hmm. so that they can make the trade rags like this yeah. is, you know, recognize sometimes that the trade press needs uh, things that they can measure Better, faster, quicker, to be able blah, blah, blah. to talk about it. Right. Um, but they aren't always an accurate thing to be measuring or a also remember, thing. like in cars, a Ferrari is a piece of crap. Right. Like it costs you like, a lot of money. It's super fast and it you breaks gotta all the time. It every day. Yeah. It has crappy interior. It's hard to get in and out. Like, like it's, it is the least human, like, 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 yes, they take great care to make this a great car, but like, mm-hmm. but like at the end of the day, it's really hard to make a good car when you only produce like a thousand of them. Like a three series BMW is probably one of the best cars on the planet because like there's 50 million of them mm-hmm. and they get all that user feedback and it gets super refined. And like, I'll be honest with you, like an Audi A4, like a three series, a C-Class, those are probably the best cars in the world because there's enough of them that you get enough feedback that they're really refined. But you get into the higher end ones, they have more quirks. Even even the highest end Mercedes, you're going to get more and more quirks the higher end you get because there's not as many people using them and there's not as much time to iterate. And you're like, how many people are working on that car versus a three series? Like there's probably going to be like 10 times as many people working on one that like that many people. The same is true with software. Right. What are you doing with the car? You know, are you yeah. are you taking it out to the track and racing it? Okay, then go get a race car. Then right? I can handle sacrifices. Yeah. Right. But if you're if you're taking it, you know, to drive to the grocery store, like maybe or an hour commute each way every day. That's yeah, going to suck. Exactly. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's see. Um, another question we had before the show, uh, which is basically like, um, what what is kind of the default security model that's going on inside a UBI image? So in other words, like what is the you know SE Linux configuration? What is the you know is the is the answer the same as RHEL or is it tweaked somehow or are there things that people should be aware of because they don't know that UBI has been modified in ABC way? Um, that they should be paying attention to when they're building, you know, an image based on say UBI. Yeah. This is an interesting question I get all the time. Like, so, so it's so funny. People are like, ah, we need to harden the image. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, what does that mean? Like there's this perception that I get this. It's like, 
it's like me when I buy a new car and then I got to modify it. I'm like, Oh, I want to tune the, like my, my crossfire is all super modified. I changed the differential. I changed that. You know, I've tuned the transmission, the, the, the ECU. It's like once then I do that, then I'm like, okay, now this is like, this is good. Like I get the warm and fuzzies. Like this is like my car. I can race this thing, but like, it's stupid. Like, like, like for a daily driver, this is not something you need to think about, but like, this is how people feel with UBI images. Like UBI images are rel images. So the, the all the binaries are hardened with like PIA and all these other things. Like in that in that comparison of container images, I go through and show all the security technologies that we use to harden all the binaries that are in these container images. So first let's back up and say containers are not real. Like like they're just processes. They are just fancy processes with more constraints around them. The host is responsible for placing those extra constraints around them, not the container image. The container image is nothing more than binaries packaged in a tarball. So like, you're like, well, what, how do I harden these binaries packaged in a tarball? Like say that out loud and you go, yeah. Oh, I mean, i I guess that, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, like you don't harden that, like not really. I mean, there's a few little things people do. Like I'll admit there's things like government has requirements for message of the day, things like that. So like mm -hmm. when you fire up a container, it literally has to have a stupid message of the day, those kinds of things. Yes. You can do things that are core build esque to a container image, but for the vast majority of it, you can put it in when you put the host into FIPS mode. The container when the process runs in the container, it will be in FIPS mode. So, like you again, do that from the host. Um, the SE Linux rules are governed by Podman, which talks to you know has its own SE Linux library, and then each of the containers are fired up in their own SE Linux context, so they're automatically more isolated than any binary that you're running on a rel host. So, like today, if you run two copies of Apache, they run in the same context. Like they can both access the same file systems. They can access the same ports, blah, blah, blah. Like if you run them in two different Podman containers, they're actually ran in dynamically generated SE Linux context. They can't talk to each other's ports. They can't talk to each other's files. They can't talk to like, and nobody even notices that SE Linux is on. That in my, like I would say 95% of the hardening comes from the host. Maybe 5% comes from the tarball with binaries in it. Right. And, 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 in a, and, and when I say that, I mean, in addition to whatever RHEL already does, like RHEL does all kinds of crazy stuff to its binaries to make sure they're hardened and crazy, you know, you know, already. So like those binaries are pretty good. Like there's definitely work that gets done there, but there's nothing that you need to do when you buy it. It's like, it's like, I just bought a tractor trailer. Like, should I put sweet rims on my tractor trailer? Like, I don't think you need to do that. Like, I think probably can carry cargo. Like it's good. Like, you know, like the basic things like it can do those. Yeah. You don't want to ramp for the trailer, not. Yeah. Spinners. <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's one of those questions that i always i know i'm that guy that always gets irritated when questions don't make sense but you're like it doesn't really make sense to think of it as hardening ubi images although i get that question all the time well that's there actually are dod standards for certain things and i have been looking at i'll confess some metadata here because since i'm a pm but like i have been talking to some dod people and thinking about how we might produce a dod specific version of ubi because they have their weird requirements I'm not even sure that I would call those actually more secure, but like, nonetheless, it's just like what they want. Right. So like, and well, you know how yeah, that works. That like, NIST like, standard yeah. is a no joke. And yeah. Well, it, that was actually specifically why I liked the phrasing of this question, which is, was not the, you know, what do I need to do to secure a container, but instead the, okay, I know by default that if I go into a rel container, um, I can I can have an expectation that Red Hat has made that a secure thing. Yeah. Are there things about UBI that I should be aware of that you had to step back from that because it's lighter weight or redistributable or any of those things? And it sounds like the answer is no, Not but really. it's good to hear the answer is no, right? Yeah. Um, it's mostly just trust that there's rel binaries in there and it uses the same packages and there's security metadata for everything that's in there, which honestly, I think is more important. The fact that you can audit and know exactly what's in there. That's, that's important to me, mm -hmm. to me, you know, my sister admin gene twitches if I don't have that. Yeah, actually speaking of which I finally got confirmation um, from uh, somebody we were talking about earlier, Brian cook, uh, that he's going to be on the show, not for a while, but uh, eventually yeah. um, that we're going to talk about the health index um, oh, in the cool. mm, Red Hat yeah. container catalog, which I think yes. is another thing that people don't kind of really look at too often. Um, but 
basically everything in the Red Hat container in a catalog is scanned. Quay does this as well. We were talking about this on the show, um, but is scanned for what's in it and what's going on there. And then on the Red Hat container catalog, it gets a straight up grade as to the quality of it. You know, when was it most It's trust updated? but verify. We try to right. show you the verify. Like, right. And and what people don't, this is, this touches on another interesting question. I'm sure we have questions around is container image scanners. So like I talked to the Stack Rocks guys already since we've, you know, since we've made that agreement to buy them. Um, and I've talked to a million partners of ours that already do this. Scanning software is only as good as the metadata that it's consuming or and or that company invents. <clears throat> it is a nightmare to scan container images that are built from scratch. Like like when I say scratch, like a C binary that you compiled yourself, threw it in a threw it in a container and, and you know, tarball, you know, basically. And then sent to somebody and be like, hey, scan this. Tell me if it's secure. Like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea if that's secure. Like, if you statically compile a C binary or Golang binary and send it to somebody, I will challenge them to analyze. Like, sure, there's decomposers and you can decompile things and, like, look at them and, like, analyze the decompiled code. But there's no way to truly look at a binary. Most of the time, what we actually mean is C binaries that are dynamically linked against libraries that come from a Linux distro. And now we're going and talking to that Linux distro and saying, hey, did you guys patch this CV? Did you patch this CV? Did you patch this other CV? And you go, yes, yes, yes. That's called metadata. Like, like that's like Red Hat provides a ton of XML metadata that we actually transparently show people which CVs we've patched, which ones we haven't, blah, blah, blah. Most Linux distros don't even have that. Like, they don't even have something like that. So most of the time, scanners are taking a wild ass guess about whether something's patched based on the version number. They're like, oh, look, that's a new version number. And I know it's patched upstream, so... So that must work. Right. I mean, this this is actually a problematic area in RHEL all the time um, yep. because people will get, um, you know, basically bad, you know, security warnings from, you know, like say, particularly like a RHEL 7 or like a RHEL 6 library um, because we backported a patch into it. So the version number hasn't changed because it still has to be backwards compatible. But wherever possible, we actually backported a CDE into it. So when you just go look at the version number, it doesn't actually tell you that the patch yep. is, is there it just tells you the version number, which, you know, in all other regards, aside from this security problem, it has not been upgraded. Right. And it was um, easier to explain at the host layer. Like people right. would have to install three, four different Linux distros, analyze them, scan them and do a ton of work. Now they just do Podman pull, Podman pull, Podman pull, Podman pull, run scanner. You know, like, mm -hmm. OK, why is these different? You know, like it's a lot easier to question it, not understand it. And so, like, you're getting a consumer a closer to a consumer level you know, analysis access as opposed to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And access. Yeah. And access. So you're generating a lot more noise questions. In my opinion, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I see happening. And the so, container scanner vendors, it's in their best interest to find as many red blood lights, you know, that they can, Oh, look at our dashboard. We found all these problems. Oh, this software must be awesome. It found all these problems. Like not to be cynical, but that there is some of that happening too. Right, right, right. Um, all right. So let's uh, talk about uh, points for a minute. And then I want to close with the uh, really question that I already Dang. Yeah, um, <laughs> that I really wanted to get to, which is, uh, you know, and so we'll give you Scott a chance to think about it for a second is like, what's what new feature or features or whatever that's coming down the pipe for UBI are you most excited about that we should get excited about? Um, but before we delve into that, let's uh, talk about our sweet, sweet internet points. Um, and let's see, does Scott remember what the sweet, sweet internet points are from the last time you were here? Ooh, you're going to put Scott on the spot. That's not cool. Yeah. I don't know. So here we have our sweet, sweet internet points. Um, the, uh, you know, the collectible points that will uh, give you that warm, fuzzy feeling inside uh, that you are participating in something greater than yourself and get these intrinsic value of these amazing Internet points. Um, we are working very hard to give them some extra value. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, as I as it's I keep saying, you know, we're working on the extrinsic version, but here is the intrinsic version. Um, so Narendev uh, at 4,900 points. Uh, Netherlands Hackham, uh, who I saw here today, um, you know, uh, uh, missed a show, I think. Uh, so uh, we need to see that catching up. Um, Noah Friction continuing going strong. Uh, Joe Fuzz, who uh, seems to be missing in the ether. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we haven't seen Joe. them in a while. Yeah. 
Um, so we hope they come back. Uh, and then Detective Conan Kudos, definitely, uh, you know, making some forward progress, um, you know, and uh, we regularly talk about Fedora as well uh, with him. Um, and then lastly, Bacon Fork, definitely on the up and up. Um, and then the people we featured from last time, uh, I saw some more points getting added there. So uh, we will feature them again in a future episode once we, uh, we see their numbers continue to go up. Uh, if you would like to collect the sweet, sweet internet points for today's episode, um, they are on the screen right now. And I'm going to drop them in the chat, assuming I got good links. Looks good there. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's our sweet, sweet internet points uh, extravaganza for the week. Um, you know, Hackham would like to remind you or like to point out that he like he did something last week, but I guess you didn't pick it up somehow. Oh, he'll resubmit is what he's saying. OK, I'll uh, I'll take a look. Uh, it is occasionally I make mistakes about uh, distributing the code. So um, right. you know, if if you are unclear on a code, uh, he, you he know, put the code in chat so you can track it if you want. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it's also obviously it's in also the, all the videos. So if mm -hmm. you watch the video again, you will find the code there. Um, so that is also how you can collect points from older shows. Um, or you can also, uh, you know, there are other ways to collect points as well. Um, so, you know, let me uh, grab a link to that. Um, but there's an activity. Oops. Uh, there's an activities page. Um, in the repo for with the show notes, which I'm going to put the link in the chat, um, that has other ways that you can earn points as well. So uh, we always love people earning points. Um, I think they're a lot of fun. So, you know, please uh, submit them at your earliest opportunity. If you join the Discord and want the points for joining the Discord, uh, please just private message me and I will send you the code. Uh, we don't have anything more sophisticated than that at the moment. Um, I was talking to a uh, Discord expert about how to uh, kind of auto submit it, um, but yeah. I haven't quite connected there's, all those dots uh discord is it's not my ways to do automation in discord <laughs> there's all kinds of crazy plugins for yeah. it like uh i saw a calendaring event app um that uh i've been trying to get the hang of it's weird it it works pretty well except uh, it doesn't understand uh 24 hour time and i was just like really this seems really obvious um so uh yeah so actually just to by way of point in the chat um Narendev, um has opened a few issues and that's part of how he uh has moved up in his points um mm -hmm. and some of those ideas actually i think one of his ideas is what led to today's show so uh you know that's how it's one of the ways we try to generate new uh episodes um is by taking questions from the audience um, so i'm gonna ask this question from jp dade uh and I'll ask it of all of us, but it was particularly focused on Scott. Uh, so, Father Linux, are you going to do the roadshow in October, November timeframe? And to be honest, folks, I don't even know where the roadshows are going to be right now. So, yeah, same. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. It'd like, be fun. It would so be great. I, I right? Like, know... I would love to cover, like, Detroit or, you know, Chicago, whatever. And go help, you know. So, I, I have been a little bit I could bit drive my RV in... out there, meet up with the Red, the red Hat truck. There you go. <laughs> side by side, we can race them. I tune my RV. <laughs> we can show you why a Ferrari is not what you want. Um, the So I have been a little bit involved in that uh, set or chunk of Summit. Um, I think it's actually more like September, October. Um, there's a bunch of cities getting set for where they're going to take place. Um, it's going to be mostly hands-on stuff, uh, whereas the – so like – the summit that's upcoming, like they probably have turned names, but I can't get them through my head. So summit part one is what I. So call. summit part one, which is like in a week or two, um, is a kind of mostly like keynote kind of sessions, and roadmappy stuff, things like that. Whereas summit part two, which is going to be like in June, um, is uh, more like traditional talks, like traditional conference talks. So a little closer to the bone, more engineering, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the ones that JP Dade was talking about and that I'm kind of talking about is, uh, you know, summit part three, which is going to be physically in person. What I heard was September, October, um, but it kind of travels to you rather than you travel to it. So right. there's going to be a whole bunch of them. Um, and hopefully there's one near your place of residence. Um, and, you know, and, and basically we'll run a bunch of hands on D stuff. So like labs or like, you know, other kinds of workshops. Um, 
and uh, so that's that's kind of the idea. Um, and I I don't know, Scott, are you uh, you know I don't know if you have anything in the the pitch bucket for it. I know there's container stuff. I know. I know I the thing I reason I know about it is because <laughs> my lab that I've been doing for several years at Summit, which is about containerizing applications and bringing them to OpenShift, uh, that's in the the offing for it. Ah. Um, well. How about this? Wherever you go, we do a road show of the level up hour. How about that? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just need, I need, uh, so we're, I guess we're, we have a, we're on the short list for labs right now. So there's, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, I have no idea. Um, but they're only going to choose 20 of the total. So I'm still, I'm still not completely in yet. Um, so, uh, you Don't know, they know who we'll you see. are. You're the illustrious language. Uh, hey, right? I, yeah, by and my lab is usually very, very popular. Um, but I know Scott's have been in the past as well. So, yes. who knows? I'll compete with you. That's right. Right, exactly. No. Um, okay. all right. So, going back to the other question, um, what are you most excited about? What's, what's the next thing that you are really looking forward to having land in UBI? I'm most excited about the roadmap for UBI Micro and what else we can build using that. I think it, we have some, just being super transparent, we have some internal build challenges figuring out how we're going to build on UBI micro. But once we figure that out, then I think we can build out a family of other images that are built on UBI micro. So I'm, my fingers are crossed. We can unblock things by like the rel nine, mm -hmm. rel eight, six time frame and get some cool family of things going for UBI micro. Like I'd, I'd love to get an open SSL image, an Apache image, an Nginx image. You know, maybe even like eventually database images and all kinds of things that are built on that UBI micro concept That'd that are just cool. really small. It's like a nice yeah. lightweight Postgres, nice. And then I'm excited about some of the work the GLibC team is doing to try to yank out another couple megabytes here and there. Like my understanding is like we probably have a roadmap to get rid of another 12, 13 megabytes. So now we're like down to like 28 megabytes uncompressed, maybe even 25 megabytes uncompressed. Mm -hmm. And then who knows what compressed, maybe. 10 you know i don't know if i'd be that, pretty happy yeah. with that like if we can get yeah. to that level i'm like super stoked now we're getting into yeah. that alpine size mm -hmm. but still using the rel content which i think is very good quality and and then also not expand you know if you use alpine with a rel like say you use alpine on openshift you're still increasing your attack service even though you don't realize it because yeah. you're bringing in all the versions of libraries that are in alpine that aren't in openshift and so now you, I mean, by definition, you're adding new permutations of packages and things. So, yeah. so to me, UBI Micro is exciting. Like, yeah, 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 it's different software. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, one of the, just to give a little bit of an example, um, you know, when, when, because I was involved in kind of this minimization activity four years ago or five years ago when it yeah, started. Yeah, I think I worked on this with you a million years yeah. ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the thing that, one of the things that was so like shocking for me in a sense is like they were talking about trying to get, you know, minimal. And part of the, part of the activity was also trying to get uh, boot times faster, that kind of stuff as well. Um, and one of the things that just blew my mind was how proud the, fedora team kind of in general was that we had gotten from four different encryption libraries that were required for boot down to two and a half <laughs> so yeah, that's cool though it's hard. right right <laughs> so so like why there's more than one is a little bit the challenge with open source right um is that there is no one who's declaring by fiat this is the answer. Um, and so, and it evolves over time. And so we have like encryption libraries, for example, that have been evolving over time, uh, you know, based on what language you're actually building your software in and all that kind of stuff. And so you kind of have this plethora of things that, that come out of that. But we've been making progress. Like, you know, we've we're kind of coming together as a software community or open source software community about trying to solve this, this problem and trying to get down to, you know, one encryption library that is used, uh, you know, through boot. And then maybe there's specialized use cases where you need other stuff, but, um, you know, for the vast majority of it, uh, you know, maybe we can get to something small. So I think that's, that's super interesting. Um, I, you know, like, I really like being able to pick up you know quote unquote off the shelf software um because especially with things like the apache and the databases and that kind of stuff because i trust the team at red hat right 
that they know how to put together an Apache, like an HTPD that will run and be secure exactly. and do all the right things way better than me configuring them. Um, and yeah, so what yeah, I want to like, do is just pick it up and like run with it. Use yeah. the power of multiple people's brains. Right, right. Like, right especially right. especially your brainers. knowledge is limited. That's yeah, one thing yeah. that you've got to remember in this space, right? Like you, yeah, you could build a scratch container and it can be really minimal and really clean and lean, but you have little idea of what oh, vulnerabilities perfect. exist in there. Well, right. a perfect example of this was like four, well, 10 years ago, before I came to Red Hat, I was a PHP MySQL like ninja. Like, like we Same. ran yeah, yeah, yeah. so much of that shit everywhere that it was insane. So like, I felt pretty confident I knew how to build the best one. And I usually built it from Red Hat bits, but then I would tweak it. I would tune this. I would do that. You know, I was getting to that level where I was like, oh, yeah, this thing is warm and fuzzy. Um, then I come to Red Hat and I'm like farting around, you know, sales, product management, product marketing, blah, blah. Like just last year, year before, I'm building a PHP MySQL thing for my blog because I'm going to confess I have not upgraded my blog and my web, my, my wiki for like 10 years. So and and media wiki will do that for you like it'll yeah. do that for you so so i did that <laughs> and i exported it all re-imported it all worked by god i mean it was actually wow. amazing but um, that is amazing but when i go into rebuild it i was like what's this fpm stuff what's this php fpm what the hell is it so i google it <laughs> i find remy the guy that packaged yep. i didn't yep. even know he was a red hat guy i just oh yeah so <laughs> in this remy guy's docs i'm like oh i guess i should move to fpm it's better because of this 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 yeah. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, it's already built into Rel. I was like, dear God, am I that out of touch? Like it had already changed in Fedora, changed upstream, but gotten pulled into Rel and it was all different. And I didn't even know like I had how a much it had very changed. similar experience at a company I used to work for a startup. Yeah. They were just like, wait, what is this new PHP paradigm? I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I got out of touch. Like I was an expert. It happens, I wasn't. man. Yeah. And I was like, like, damn it. I was like, damn it. So, you know, I used to like, you know, run through MySQL databases like they were, you know, nothing. Oh. And now if you put yeah. me on the MySQL command line, I probably couldn't get myself out of a wet paper bag. So, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's it's just one of those things. Right. And like, this is dude, why I trust Remy. I know he knows right. stuff. like, yeah. right. I'm like, dude, he built this. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, and he and like, yeah, and him as, as a kind of a canonical example of like lots of other people at Red Hat and kind of in the oh, open source totally. community in general, yeah. um, like he not only uh, kind of does his day job of packaging PHP and all that other jazz, he maintains an entire repo on the side that has all the stuff that he isn't comfortable putting in RHEL that you might mm -hmm. need um, yeah. because, you know, you might need it for something. But he does that in his spare time, right? Yeah, that's um, his free and, time he's using to do like, that. Exactly. He, and so, uh, yeah, if you ever go to Fosdem, um, definitely look for him. Uh, he's a super nice French guy. Um, uh, he's already been uh, trying to uh, twist or, you know, modify, cause whatever his uh, son to get into the field as well. Uh, so wow. he's, I think his son is already doing Berger some packaging, um, wow. which nice. I find hilarious. We need to like, like 16, 18, something like that. We need to have like the Emmys of like open source. Like we need right? to give them a award, like an Oscar. Like here's your open source. We could totally do that. We should totally we like right that. here. We could totally yeah, we do, do it on the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, Remy deserves that. He deserves like an Oscar for like yeah. his performance in 2013. Come on, that was epic. Yeah, right, right, exactly. right. <laughs> uh, Carlos O'Donnell with GLibC. Carlos would also uh, get an Oscar. You know, yeah. um, but if we put him on the show, obviously uh, we would all have to dress up because I have never seen him in not a suit. Um, like, yeah, ooh. he even he because he works he works remote, works from home just like all of us are doing lately. He does it in a suit. Um, it's amazing. And, it and amazing. not only is it a suit, but he looks like good. Like he is well-dressed. Um, yeah. It took it's me not, like it's three not months into the suit. pandemic to just give up on anything but t-shirt and gym shorts. Right. right. This is, right. this is standard PM outfit, like a button up shirt. And no yeah, pants. yeah. Yeah. Right. Like... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I give off the vibe of being just a hair more dressed up. But I, I like this idea. I wonder how we could do it. You know, it's like, you know, uh, the, I think we could do like a dedicated award show and invite all the right. open source people. Right. Like not just Red Hatters, but I'm talking like, right, right. And like, you know, an hour and a half, you know, thank you very much for X, Y, Z thing. And off we go. And we just that'd be you know, hilarious. Pick 10, um, 12 people and off we go. I think we could totally do it. I, I try to figure out how we'd pick the 10 or 12 people though. Oh, is it, like it would be something we do on a regular basis. Right, right. Or semi-regular I mean, there's, basis. There's yeah. literally a lot. Millions. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Potentially tens of thousands. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. McCarty, for your time. Uh, I reiterate, uh, you know, follow him on Twitter, Father Linux. Uh, he says uh, mostly controversial things on the Internet. Um, and uh, but they're always entertaining. Uh, so, you know, uh, we highly recommend, uh, not, uh, you know, everything that he writes uh, is worth reading. Um, so definitely check that stuff out. Uh, let us know if you have more questions. We can always have Scott come back. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we covered, uh, you know, kind of what's going on with UBI, what we're excited about, uh, why you should use it. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, talk about it more next time. Um, so, Chris, you want to tell us what's coming up? On yes. the channel. So next up at 11 a.m. Eastern, if I'm reading the calendar right, 1500 UTC, we are going to be talking about day two operations in OpenShift. And we're actually breaking it up into multiple parts. Andrew is going to come on. And it's like day two operations part one is <laughs> what's coming up. So it's kind of eh? okay. Day two dot one. <laughs> day right. Two dot yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, day two operations can be extensive depending upon your environment right like if you all of a sudden you're like hey great i've got this open shift thing but now i need it over there on that disconnected network yeah that's that's like a whole different ball game right so yeah um plain risky wants us to have an episode when ubi micro launches so well, that's a good uh, idea like if you want to come on and highlight that stuff we'd more than welcome you anytime um but then later today, after the, the day two operations, we've got uh, OpenShift Commons. We're going to be talking to my friend Baruch from JFrog. And then the scalable multiplayer game design game at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Cool beats. So, yeah, cool full beats. day of content for y'all. And remember, we'll have uh, Chris Wright, CTO of Red Hat, on the show next week, um, and then Summit soon after that. We will be dark for, I think, both Summit and KubeCon. Yes. Um, there will be content on the channel, but most of it will be focused on Summit and KubeCon. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the Summit week, we're kind of just like, okay, there's Summit, done. Okay. Know? And then uh, KubeCon week. Uh, so we have... OpenShift Commons gathering, day zero event. Uh, I'll be hosting, and this will be on. That'll be on the channel during KubeCon, and then we have various uh, community office hours that kind of line up to breaks in the KubeCon schedule, so that you don't have to feel like you're missing something uh, that week of KubeCon. It's all on the calendar. I encourage you to check it out. Subscribe to the calendar. It, you know, please. Uh, I'll drop a link to it right now, and uh, yeah, enjoy. Join us for our journeys. How about that? exactly um cool i'm really looking for the forward to the service mesh one of the office hour so yes, uh yeah same. i think it'd be cool um all right thanks everybody thanks have a great one be safe out there everyone thank you, you scott and thank yeah, you audience. thanks for having me take care